Hey guys, Mr. P. This video is an introduction into microscopy. So the first thing we need to do is calibrate ourselves in terms of how we're going to think about the, the scale of, of items that are going to be looked at under a microscope. So when we look at this particular image, the length scale of biology, you can see that there are different areas on this, that you have what the human eye can see without magnification. You have a magnifying glass, which gives you a little bit of magnification. You have conventional light microscope, which we use in class. You have the range that the electron microscopy can provide you, which is a little bit more. And then you have your largest magnification uh, technology in the form of X-ray crystallography. So if we talk about kind of some of the things that the unaided human eye can see, it's individual organisms, it's individual organs within those organ systems, it's individual eggs. You get into smaller organisms and then smaller eggs of smaller organisms. When you get into the range of what the light might microscope can provide you magnification of, you re really run from about one millimeter all the way through about one micrometer. So this entire range from one millimeter to one micrometer is what the light microscope will typically provide you magnification of. Within that range, you see a variety of bacteria cells, which are prokaryotes. You see a variety of plant and animal cells, which are your eukaryotes. Some of the human cells that are, are smaller than individual tissue cells, like the red blood cells can be seen. Individual protists, like paramecium, euglena, can also be seen. And then to go beyond on that one micrometer, you have to utilize the electron microscopy techniques, which span into the nanometer range. If you really want to go sub nanometer range, you have to get into that x-ray crystallography and you're getting down into the level of the atoms. So what is the difference between magnification and resolution? They are two terms that sound very similar to each other and they often get used interchangeably, but magnification is the increase in an object's image size compared to its actual size. So if it is a larger image compared to how big it is in real life, there is some magnification there. You can see in this particular image that as we increase our magnification, we get closer and closer to the particular object or the particular object object, like the dog's nose, gets progressively bigger. That is magnification. As the resolution of a microscope increases, the greater the detail that microscope will reveal. And resolution, on the other hand, refers to the minimal distance between two points or objects at which they can still be distinguished as two. As the resolution of the microscope increases, the greater the detail the microscope will reveal, and resolution is often explained through clarity, so the greater resolution provides greater clarity. You can see these two columns. The one on the left provides more clarity. You can see more surface detail than the column on the right. The magnification is the same in both columns. The object is as large as it is in the other object, however, there is more or increased clarity so therefore increase resolution on the left hand side of this image. As we magnify the object, it gets bigger than it is in real life. And between these two, we can see that this one provides greater clarity. And so it has greater resolution. You can magnify it one step further. And again, the one on the left also has greater resolution, greater clarity. So all microscopes have the ability to provide magnification and all microscopes have a resolution. Now, as the microscope increases in value or increases in cost, it typically has greater resolving power. But in order to calculate total magnification, you have to utilize this particular equation. Total magnification of a microscope equals the ocular lens times the objective lens. So what is the ocular lens? The ocular lens is the lens that you specifically look through. Some microscopes have two ocular lenses. Some microscopes have one. This microscope has two ocular lenses. Ocular lenses have a magnification of 10 times. So this lens or these lenses will magnify the object 10 times and the objective lenses range from four to 100 times. We'll just call this particular objective lens the 40 times objective. And so if we were to calculate total magnification, you could say total magnification or TM equals the ocular lens at 10x times the objective lens at 40x, which gives you the total magnification power of 400 times. 10 times 40 is 400. The total magnification of this particular microscope utilizing that objective lens will give us a 400 times magnification. If we were using the 100 times objective, then obviously we would go 
total magnification equals 10 times ocular lens times the 100 times objective lens, which would give you a total magnification of 1,000 times. So as you increase the magnification of the objective lens, it will, with the ocular lens, provide you an increased magnification overall. Light microscopes, like I said earlier, are the microscopes we use in class. This is an image of a light microscope. Light microscopes use a light source from below. It shines the light up through the specimen. It is collected by the objective lens. It hits off a couple of prisms and mirrors and will travel through the objective lens into your eye. So this is where you would observe, right? If this was your eyeball. The light would enter your eyeball through the pupil but would go through the ocular lens on the light path through the microscope. In the meantime, these lenses are gonna be magnifying in both areas. Again, this was 10 times ocular lens. This one was our 40 times objective lens. And when you utilize the light microscope, you can begin to see objects that are very clear and they provide you the ability to see them at increased size over what they typically are in nature. So light microscope uses light passing through dead or living specimens to form an image. Sometimes stains are required and may improve the visibility of structures. Some structures are clear or transparent and require stain in order to make them colorful and therefore contrasted with the background and provides contrast to other similar structures around the same general area. Light microscopes are very easy to use. They're relatively inexpensive, comparatively speaking to, let's say, electron microscopes, can observe dead or living cells, and in color, the ability to see living cells is one of the distinguishing features of a light microscope. Cell movement can be studied because the cells can be alive. You can watch the cells move. Quick specimen preparation, you can typically prepare specimens in minutes to an hour, depending on the type of specimen and the type of preparation technique. No need for high voltage electricity. The microscopes we use in class have cords, but they have rechargeable batteries, and so we aren't even necessarily tethered to an electrical outlet. They utilize LEDs, so very low voltage electricity. Now, on the other hand, electron microscopes are the other type of microscopy that we're gonna talk about in this particular class. There are two types of electron microscopes that we're going to talk about. One of them is an SEM or a scanning electron microscope. This one on the right would be an SEM, scanning electron microscope. The one on the left would be a TEM or a transmission electron microscope. The structure is the same. You are utilizing an electron gun, sending electrons or beams of electrons through a specimen and then collecting those electrons in a screen in order to generate an image. Now, the difference between SEM and TEM is transmission electron microscope. The electrons will pass through the specimen to provide you a 2D interior shot of the specimen that you're studying. A scanning electron microscope will provide you actual surface detail of the specimen because the electrons don't pass through the specimen. They bounce off and are captured by an electron detector which provides you a three-dimensional image of the surface of a particular structure. So electron microscopes use beams of electrons focused by an electromagnet to magnify and resolve. They provide the greatest magnification and can actually provide a magnification of a hundred to 300,000 times and resolution of 0 0.001 micrometers. If we put that in perspective to the light microscope we just talked about, light microscopes typically have a maximum total magnification of 1,000 times. We're now talking about the 100 to 300,000 times, so substantially more magnification. We can see substantially smaller organisms and structures, but while the electron microscope is incredible, it does have some limitations, especially in a high school setting. It is incredibly expensive. These microscopes can be a million dollars, which obviously means that high schools can't afford them. They require the cells that you're looking at or the specimens you're looking at to be killed and chemically treated, and the chemical treatment typically requires them to be coated in a heavy metal so that they can withstand the energy associated with the electron beams. No cell movement can be seen. Because the cells are required to be killed, you therefore can't watch the cells move in their natural environment. Without stain or dye, no color can be seen. Typically, electron microscopes are gonna provide you a black and white image. High voltage electric current is required. Because we're using an electron gun and shooting high energy electrons through or at a, a subject, it requires high voltage electricity to utilize the microscope. 
The specimen preparation usually takes a few days. Again, the light microscope, we can prepare specimens in minutes. In the electron microscope, it usually takes a few days. So how do we prepare a wet mount slide to be used with our light microscope? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to put a specimen on the slide. In this particular image, our specimen is a little bit of leaf. We will use a pipette and place a drop of water on the specimen, which will completely encase the specimen in water. The next step is you place the edge of a glass cover slip over the sample at an angle and carefully lower the cover slip into place. It is really, really critical that you place the cover slip at an angle. So you put one edge of the cover slip down on the slide and then you let the cover slip fall like a door down against the glass slide. Last thing, if there is too much water that will spill out or come out from between the cover slip and the slide, the cover slip will slide around. And so you need to take a piece of chem wipe or a piece of paper towel and you have to hold it close to the edge so that the water or excess water can be removed so that the cover slip doesn't slide around. Sometimes when we prepare our wet mount slides, we have to utilize a stain. Some of our stains can be a simple stain, which means you're simply adding a drop or two of stain to the sample in order to make the cells that you're observing or the structures you're observing have some contrast between the environment and other structures within the slide. Sometimes you have to use a differential stain technique, like the Gram stain. The image on top, that is a image where we applied methylene blue, which is a simple stain. You can see the structure that we stained blue are blue. A differential stain is a stain technique that is utilized to differentiate two different types of cells based on anatomical features, the Gram stain obviously being one example of that. Now, you don't have to worry about the specific steps of the Gram stain, but basically you're using two different stains along with a mordant and a decolorizer. The crystal violet is the first stain. You're then going to set the stain with a mordant of iodine. You're gonna decolorize the stain from the cells that won't hold the stain. In this case, the gram-negative cells will not hold them. And then you counter stain with safranin. So the fact that we are staining with crystal violet and then coming in and counter staining safranin, crystal violet being purple, safranin being red, you can see that the image that is produced will differentiate the two cells that are on this slide. Microscope field of view. So the microscope field of view is the diameter of the observable space. So in order to estimate the size of a specimen viewed with a microscope, you must first know the size of the field of view diameter, either by direct measurement or calculation. Again, the field of view is the diameter of the area that is visible through the microscope. So when I put the objective lens to, let's say, 40 times, and I look through the eyepiece, and I see this particular image, I can see cells on here, and I can go about trying to estimate the size of these structures, but it is impossible to estimate the size of the structures without knowing what this distance from the left side to the right side of this field of view is. And so the way that you can do that is you can calculate it or you can actually measure. As magnification increases, the field of view diameter is smaller. And so you can see these particular images. If we put a ruler on our microscope and we looked at the ruler through a 20 times objective, you can see that the field of view actually runs 0.6 millimeters, basically a little over half a millimeter. If we change to a 50 time objectives, that field of view is cut down to 0.25 millimeters, so a quarter of a millimeter. If we go in a little farther, or if we magnify farther to 100 times, you can see that we change our field of view to 0.12 millimeters. As magnification increases, the field of view decreases, which is why images get bigger and bigger and bigger in the field of view. So how do we determine the field of view by diameter? So there are two methods. Method one, we can put a ruler onto our slide, and we can physically measure. So we place a transparent metric ruler under the low power objective lens of a microscope to measure the diameter of the field of view. If this was a ruler that we were measuring, we could actually measure the field of view by saying one, two, three, four, five millimeters. And we would call that field of view five millimeters, if those marks were in fact millimeters. Method two is we can utilize a equation. So the diameter of LP is the measured field of view at low power. That is the measured field of view at low power. That is what we just measured, okay? We use the low power and we are going to then calculate our diameter at high power using this equation. So this is the low power magnification and this is the higher medium power magnification to ultimately get our diameter of the high power objective. 
And that's going to be it for this video. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you later.